Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for HPE Discover 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, with my partner Dave Vellante, co-host. Two days, three days of wall to wall, because we're on day two with our next guest, Paul Seville, Global Practice Lead for Network and Edge at Kindrill, CUBE alumni. Welcome back, Paul. Thank Mayor you. Mayor Baroth, Vice President, yes. Global Partner Ecosystem for HPE Networking. Great to see you guys, CUBE alumni, back Thanks. again. Yes. Great to be back. Okay, so first of all, before we get Mayor, we, Antonio Neri was on earlier, and he said, networking is going to be the big bet. Yes. Not that they didn't bet on it already, but going <laughs> forward, <laughs> Green Lake was a bet. Yeah. You got the data from MapR, yeah. now moves in with um, Esmeralda, now you got networking with Juniper coming around yeah. the horizon. So, props to you, you're in the hot seat. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so before I talk about the big bet with networking, I do want to congratulate Paul and the entire Kindle team. We're going to be talking a lot about the edge, and I'm happy to say that at the HPE Partner Awards on Monday, uh, Kindle won the Edge Partner of the Year Award, so Paul, congratulations yes. to you well, and the team. thank you, and thank you for the recognition. Paul, congratulations, how do you feel? <laughs> I feel great about it. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to anyone out there while you were here. <laughs> All my team, they're a great, great team. Yeah. That yeah, give an update on the partnership, the ecosystem's changing, obviously the AI injection yeah. is going to be massive. We saw yeah. NVIDIA relationship, the private cloud. Yeah. You guys have been doing a lot of work, been on theCUBE many times talking about this. The transformation's happening. Why the award, what's, what's the excitement? Give us the overview. Well, the, the, what's really exciting is just all the introduction of AI into everything that we're seeing now. I mean, when we come, I was uh, talking to Mayor earlier about how uh, attending these sessions, it's just infiltrating every single corner, nick and cranny. But we're also not only just seeing it with HP, we're seeing it with our, with our other partners, we're seeing it at Kentrell. Uh, and Kindrel itself has been really building in a lot of AI capabilities into its management systems and its, and its operating structure. And so that, that integration of AI into networking and the role that networking plays in supporting AI is what I think is really uh, exciting right now. You know, we talk about um, AI for networking and networking for AI. AI right. It's been mm -hmm. a big conversation. The same move in security, we heard that same in the security world, which obviously has a network of impact. What does that do for the edge? Because you know, we see the edge as another big bet for yeah. HP, we know that, although networking kind of implies the edge. But if you look at cloud, now AI data centers and edge, it's distributed computing. Mm -hmm. What's an intelligent edge these days? Can it, we should talk about that pre-gen AI. Can you guys talk about where we are on the edge uh, progress spectrum? Yeah, so I think, you know, basically intelligence at the edge, you're talking about making real-time decisions to drive superior business outcomes but I do want to double click on some of the resource constraints which I think people don't fully understand about uh, implementing this AI at the edge. And you know, top of mind, four things uh, come up for me. One is any time you talk about AI and running these large language models, uh, you need this high performance computing power. Mm -hmm. And along with the high performance computing power comes just the energy, right? Where are you going to get the power for all these high performance uh, computing stuff? So I think power is something we really need to think about because it's very also closely linked with sustainability. And the other aspect that Paul and me were just discussing is security at the edge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit of a dual-edged sword because one could say that you now don't have data going across the length and breadth of the internet. All of the data is residing at the edge, but then the question is how secure is the data? Where are you going to store that data? So I think those are two things that you have to call out when you think about AI at the edge. When we were at RSA this year talking to customers, they said the two biggest things they were most interested in learning about, one was of course security for Gen AI, yeah. the other was security for multi-cloud. Yeah. And because they're having troubles securing it, and the security yeah. Yeah. framework is different. So, but, but generally speaking, the hybrid cloud, it's taken a long time to bake, and we've kind of figured that out. Now you mm -hmm. introduce edge. My question is, how does that edge security affect the consistency of experience that we've now finally gotten to with hybrid cloud. Is it break mm -hmm. that? Um, you got to, security first, yes. so you would presumably prioritize security over the consistency of experience, but maybe not. How do you balance those? Yeah, I, you know, it's, I think it's opening up a different world, another no, new yeah. vector for security that we got to worry, and largely because at the edge, the edge is related to operational technology. Operational technology that we're now trying to draw tons of information from, that all these sensors and capabilities yeah. that can generate so much data, but historically, you got to understand that in these manufacturing plants, in these big facilities, these energy facilities, that operational technology was never really a point of concern because it wasn't connected to anything. 
thing, right? And so the plant managers felt <laughs> like, oh, I don't got to worry about security now. Now, gapped. now <laughs> it is very different, right? And it's changing that whole dynamic around mm -hmm. the security front, and I think we're really having just to take another step back and look at how yeah. do we now make yeah. this consistent and policies available to uh, uh, manage this security profile consistently across the whole landscape from, from core cloud out to the very edge. Yeah. Mayor and Paul, we've talked about this early on in our first interviews together on theCUBE was, it was simple. It was an edge device that had yeah. power, networking, and some capabilities to compute. Okay, it's connected. Yeah, yeah. Now you're seeing Edge AI change that conversation. I want to get your guys' reactions on how that's playing out in the field. We saw announcements from Apple had a big event, their worldwide developer conference, sort of Mobile World Congress. It's a device edge too. Yeah. So device mm -hmm. to core is a piece. We see AI as looking at computation on the device, a lot of private potentially information there, so privacy, data, yeah. governance. So you're seeing that trend for computing on the, on the device itself and doing inference or reinforced learning. Yeah. Does that change any of the equation for you guys as in, in your current motions with customers? Are they thinking that far out or is that just, just starting to come online? Or is that, is that the right direction? Yeah, I think there are two aspects there and uh, you know, I was just at an earlier session when I was talking to a partner. I think whenever you talk about AI, whether it is at the edge or anywhere else, I believe another notion that organizations are still thinking through is the cultural impact on organizations. So many a times you go to somebody and say, you know, we launched this AI project, and I can assure you at some point of time, people are thinking I'm probably automating or getting rid of my own role in the process. <laughs> and I think that cultural aspect of the balance between innovation and people yeah. is something that organizations are still uh, grapp grappling with. Mm. And the second area from all of the customer conversations I've had, I think a big thing for customers is how do I fund this AI at the edge? They know they need to go in that direction because it's going to give them a competitive advantage down the line. Yeah. But where is the funding going to come from for that transformation? So I think those are two interesting notions coming out. Uh, you know, who wants to automate and obsolete their own role? Yeah, and yeah. if I'm doing it, where do I get the money for it from? <laughs> well, in our survey data with our partner ETR shows that about 42% of the customers tell us that they're funding Gen AI by stealing from other budgets. Other budgets. And these are uh, IT people. Interesting. Okay, they're not OT <laughs> people. So now you bring in the OT folks and say, okay, where are they getting their budget? <laughs> right, so it's not like the CFO is just saying, here, there's a bunch of dough. Check, yeah. And so they're looking for, and we always say they're hitting singles right now yeah. in the enterprise. Yeah. You know, the ROI, the NPVs aren't ginormous like they are, you know, internet companies who can sell ads yes. by building bigger GPU clusters. So, so how, what are you seeing in terms of the customers, those, those use cases that have the potential mm -hmm. to, to give ROI you know, within say the next six to 12 months that can be self-funding. Yeah, that's actually a large part of the work that we're doing at mm. Kindle with customers. You know, we're, we're helping them to work through the use cases that mm -hmm. can, and the financial cases that can justify the deployment of this, uh, of this edge infrastructure and where to, where to work AI into the, into the equation. The other thing that, that we're really um, helping customers with is create the foundation for AI readiness with them. You know, uh, a lot of people still don't really understand how important it is to have the data framework and have the, the great amounts, of, you, AIs yeah. need a great amount of data to uh, make accurate decisions and they need that data to be accurate itself, they need good data integrity, or else they're not going to get the right, right answers. So those, are, those two areas are areas that actually, you know, yeah. Kindrel is really a, uh, a key part of, of our, our proposition and, and to customers. And explain what you bring to the table there and what role HPE plays yeah. in that whole dynamic. Yeah, so the, what we bring to the table is we bring a consultative approach. So we can go in with customers and help them analyze their, their environment that they're trying to work with. So let's like, say they're, they're some kind of a manufacturing facility, and we look at all the different types of technologies that are available for them that they use in that, what it would take to introduce AI into that equation, and then we start working with partners like HPE to uh, look at different types of, e of equipment configurations, compute configurations that would be right for that environment. He was mentioning yeah. the, how power is such an important thing in this. Uh, there's, there's those types of parameters that we have to deal with that is unique for every customer. And if I come to the data aspect, right, any AI model that you run today, or a large language yeah. model that you run, is only as good as the data you are able to collect at the source. Otherwise, if you go back to the old analytics acronym, it's GJO, garbage in, yeah. garbage out. You feed the wrong yeah. data into an AI model, you're not going to get the outcome that you are asking for. So I think that's where HPE comes in, because we can help you garner the right data at the edge across industries. 
I want to ask a question for both of you guys because you're on the cutting edge of this right now. Networking is a big part, obviously. That packets move from point A to point B, they're stored, they're processed. AI is going to be a big part of that. How are, how are customers looking at their asset right now? Obviously 5G's here, uh, is happening, it's accelerating that. When customers look at AI at the edge, what, what value's in place that's already there that they're leveraging on? Is it the network, is it the 5G? Do they have to get the 5G first? What are some of the prerequisites, I guess, for edge AI to get going? What do you guys see? Well, you know, there is no one size fits all in the, in the sense of the wireless types of networks that, that are there. There's, what we see is that uh, companies that really want to leverage AI at the edge to get, to get real uh, business value uh, wind up needing to update their infrastructure because uh, Wi-Fi may not be suitable for this environment to actually reach out to all the new, the new dev devices and the operational technology that they need to connect back in. So incrementing the, what they already have with newer technologies like private uh, 5G services are sometimes the, the path that they need to go. But in other situations, you know, that's, that's not needed. It's, o it's overkill. It's really more of a manager, it's mo really more of a si situation of integration of operational technology with the wireless networks to bring it back into, the, into their data lakes that, that we can really accumulate all of this to, to start building good AIs for, for good business outcomes. You know, when you think nice. about the whole world of edge AI, and I have a live deal with a hotel that we are working on right now, we spoke about some of the financial constraints of you know, what customers are going through to fund this yeah. transformation. Customers nowadays want to go asset light, and you know, we have a great solution with HP GreenLake as a service basis. But the current hotel that we are bidding on, the hotel group is telling us, why do I need to pay for an access point if I'm running at 50% occupancy in my hotel? If a room is not taken for the night, I don't want to be paying for that AP. Can you guys give me a pricing model which replicates my business? <laughs> if I'm at 50% occupancy, then I'll pay for 50% of the network. So I think it's just going to evolve some very interesting, oh, that's commercial an interesting conversation. Are you leaning into that deal? Are you, are you going to bring the green lake <laughs> model? Are we you are deploying bringing the green that? model into And that what do they say? They're like, oh, you crazy? It's complex. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> no, but that's a good example yeah, of yeah. the fixed cost of a device yeah. in the holistic solution yeah. of the customer yeah. because there's got to be more there because there's AI coming at exactly. the edge. Exactly. And it's a good example of aligning you know, yeah. the pricing structures with customers. And, yeah. and because, like, let's face it, I mean, the, just look at the SaaS business. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the model's flawed. flawed. And the customers have basically said, one of these days, you yeah. know, we're going <laughs> it's going to be turned about. So, you know, things evolve. Yeah. I, I want to um, ask you about uh, the Athernet acquisition yeah. and private 5G. Was yeah. that we were there at Mobile World Congress two yeah. years ago, yeah. 2022, when you announced the acquisition. Yeah. How's that going? I know you guys have brought some solutions to market. Yeah. What's the dynamics in that market today? What are we seeing? Yeah, I mean, I'll let you. Yeah, start. I'll start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Athernet has been a great acquisition for us. You know, at its Heart, it's basically a mobile core, and the way they've designed that mobile core, it's tailor-made for system integrators, so that a SI like Kindrel can offer, uh, you know, superior services to their customers. Athernet is completely open when it comes to radio technology, architecture, and applications. And uh, just a couple of weeks back, uh, Kindrel has announced uh, it's open out there. They made a media announcement that they will be developing their service and solutions on Athernet. And one of the best use cases of Athernet that you know. I particularly like because I think, in a way, it's a service to humanity, is Athonet has something called as Athonet in a backpack. So just think about a situation where there's an earthquake, the network is down, we can basically go in with this Athonet backpack, start up a 5G network with the ease of, you know, just starting up an access point, and people have a network connection during a disaster. And that's a great, you know, as I said, a humanity use case for me. Interesting, who was the guy who had the backpack, the cloud can, in the backpack? We can use that for the cube. <laughs> 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 we can use that for the cube, <laughs> fam. We'll there do you a go. mobile cube, mobile base cube station, yeah. live yeah. G, yeah. pop up cube in a backpack. With. <laughs> Always yeah. have bandwidth, is my <laughs> rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 this cutting edge, you guys love having you on the cube. What's the, the partnership? Talk about the, um, your partnership together, how's that going? Yeah. You got the award, what's next? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about that. Since we, so uh, just, uh, 
few months back, we announced that we've chosen Athernet as our, as our um, uh, open RAN solution yeah. for, for Kindrel. And you know, we, we've, uh, a couple of years ago when Kindrel launched, we created private wirelessing as, as yeah. one of the areas that we're going to focus to, to uh, as our growth vector for us. And uh, we just really were impressed with the Athernet solution, its roadmap, how it plans to integrate with uh, Wi-Fi and start creating more unified networks, the management system, the vision that you've yeah. gotten around the management system has also really attracted us to us. So we're excited to start bringing some of those solutions to market right. together. Yeah, and I think as far as partnership goes, I'm going to borrow a line from yesterday's keynote. So, you know, Antonio said, intelligence has no limitations. And I think as far as the Kindle HP partnership goes, you know, their expertise in services, their consulting uh, capability, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg on what we can do together. Uh, the one last point I do want to mention, since you know we've spoken a lot about AI, is there are two things on this AI topic that I have to say is that we need responsible and inclusive AI, right? Uh, it's AI has to be for everybody. Uh, there has to be certain ethics around the AI, even at the edge, and it has to be developed with a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, you guys are doing great work. Paul, we had a great chat at Mobile World Congress. Check out yeah. the CUBE videos. We talked a lot about this private, services mm -hmm. you guys have been doing, and again, the networking top prop priority, you guys are doing great there, congratulations on everything. And Thank you, uh, always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having pleasure Let's dig you. into it. We're going to do a lot of networking this year, Dave, I think it's a priority for <laughs> HPE. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, you're watching theCUBE, we'll be right back with more coverage from day two of our live coverage. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante and Rebecca Knight. Stay tuned after this short break. <laughs>